Um, I, um, I mean, I agree. It's a no-brainer that, uh, that we should have the right to marry. But uh, I also think equally that it's a no-brainer that the institution of marriage should not exist. So uh, <laughs> that... And part of it, why it causes me trouble is because uh, fighting for gay marriage generally involves lying about what we're going to do with marriage when we get there. You know, because we lie that the institution of marriage is not going to change. And that is a lie. The institution of marriage is going to change and it should change. Speaking on Hobart 7HOFM, Mr. Turnbull said he expects same-sex marriage to be legalised after the plebiscite. I will be voting yes to legalise same-sex marriage and I think the plebiscite will be carried. And I think there will be a positive vote. Opposition leader Bill Shorten quoted in the Age newspaper. Mr. Shorten says, Within 100 days, we will put legislation in the Parliament for marriage equality and all MPs can vote according to their choice. Labor will get the job done quickly. Speaking to SBS Mardi Gras host Patrick Abood, Mr Turnbull said a yes vote in the plebiscite would result in same-sex marriage being legalised. I can absolutely guarantee you that if my government is returned, there will be a plebiscite on same-sex marriage after the election. And if the plebiscite is carried, then same-sex marriage will be law. So for the first time in Australia, we've got the leaders of the two major parties, both Malcolm Turnbull and Bill Shorten from the Labor Party, in agreement on their desire to see a change in the Marriage Act. With the Liberal National Party, it's going to go to a plebiscite. If they're re-elected, it'll go to a plebiscite. With the ALP, they promised a redefinition of marriage within the first 100 days. So the social landscape in Australia is going to radically change as soon as even inside the next year. In recent years, a growing divide has started to form in the West between a new progressive agenda and the conservative traditions that came before it. Rushing to keep pace, our elected leaders are enacting all kinds of new social programs and laws so these new ideas can find acceptance and protection in our communities. It seems for the most part that the media has taken up the progressive cause and in some cases refusing to even air paid advertising from the other side of the debate. With radical social change knocking on our doors, most Australians are unaware of just how deep it really goes. It seemed in the early days that the LGBT community fought for their rights to be free of the constraints of mainline society. But something changed along the way and we seem to be coming back to another point where a traditional value set is in the way of yet another goal. As the countdown to a plebiscite on same-sex marriage gathers pace, we wanted to ask some questions and find out what is likely to happen if the definition of marriage was changed in Australia. Will we still have the right to agree or disagree as we do now and live as we choose? And what can we learn from other countries that have gone before us? Now you may think that if you just let people have their gay marriages, that everything will be fine and they'll all, all of this stuff will all just go away. Well, I can tell you based on experience in the United States and just looking around other countries in the world, that's not really the case. I mean, really, do you really think that this is the last thing you're going to be asked to accept? In the United States, very quickly after the Supreme Court redefined marriage by removing the gender requirement for marriage, very soon after that, the movement for transgender rights became much more pronounced and much more prominent. And you may have heard President Obama issued an executive order requiring every school in the United States to have transgender bathrooms. And no one, I think, expected that when they said, I support the right of my gay nephew or my lesbian co-worker to marry the person they want. No one expected that that's where it was all going to go. But in point of fact, that is where it goes. So ask yourself this, Australia. Do you really think gay marriage is the last thing you're going to be asked to accept? Do you really think that all of this will just go away? When I was 16, I became involved in a lesbian relationship. That led to a bit of conflict at home when mum found out and initially that caused me to move out when I was 16 with my lesbian lover. So we were in a relationship for seven years and during that time initially we mixed in the homosexual, transgender and lesbian world. Then we kind of narrowed it down to be, being a part more of the lesbian community and eventually I became a separatist, a very extreme women only community. I lived on a women's commune in northern New South Wales. Even within my seven-year relationship 
Initially we were monogamous, but after that we became polygamous, so we uh, weren't faithful to each other, which was very acceptable in our community, but very destructive. So as a former LGBT activist, Adelina brings a unique perspective to the whole question of marriage and traditional views, and we'll be coming back to her shortly for more comments. But with a strong media filter heavily reporting one side of the debate, we are being told that the vast majority of Australia is in strong support for a change in the Marriage Act. So we took hold of an opportunity to step outside of the mainstream commentary and speak with the managing director of the Australian Christian Lobby, Lyle Shelton. There's a lot of figures that are being bandied about into the support of the Australian community for change. What have you found in that? What are the true statistics according to ACL on where things really stand? You see all sorts of um, figures, as you say, Damien. Um, I mean, on Q&A that night, the CEO of Roy Morgan Research, Michelle Levine, said 76% of Australians supported changing the definition of marriage. Now, I've never seen a poll that says that, and I asked her off air after the program, and she couldn't tell me. She said she'd send me the details. I've emailed their office I've, to this day. I've not received a reply. Um, most of the polls we have seen, and there was about four last year, which put it around about 59%. Um, there's a proportion there that's a very soft yes, um, and some deeper polling work that, that I've seen that's been done uh, shows that uh, people haven't seen the other side of the argument. In, in, in your experience as, as now running as the Senate candidate for the Christian Democratic Party, how are you finding um, articulating that side of the debate? Eh? I think what happens is when you talk to people, they have a lack, again, a lack of understanding of the consequences that this would bring to our society. A lot of people, they're rung up by a, a polling company um, in this climate of, you know, well, people think it's inevitable and you're a bigot and a hater if you don't support it, so they'll, they'll say yes on the phone. But we think once uh, they are allowed, if they are allowed, if we can get this through the media filter, that uh, there is another side of the debate that affects children, that affects uh, freedom. So why aren't Australians hearing more qualified commentary from those on the other side of the question on marriage? Well, throughout this documentary, we'll be checking in with Professor Neil Foster, who is an Associate Professor of Law at Newcastle University, New South Wales, to get his reflections on the climate of the debate. I think the particular the question that we're dealing with is, uh, is it possible for um, a person who opposes same-sex marriage to be able to make a public statement about that without being caught by the laws? Um, and I think, uh, in fact, that what Parliament ought to do when it passes the legislation for the plebiscite is to make it really clear that um, anyone who engages in uh, good faith attempt to, in, to, to, to debate these issues um, should not be deemed to be inciting hatred against people of um, particular sexual orientation. Did you feel external pressure uh, from the larger community? I mean, there's, there's a narrative of uh, there's a lot of bigoted, hateful people out there who just are very anti lesbian, anti gay in general. Did you, did you feel that inside the community? I've never felt um, externally persecuted or bullied or uh, rejected because of my sexuality. I was a very active, um, expressive lesbian back in the 80s when, you know, it was quite some years ago and um, I was very obviously a lesbian in the way that I dressed in my, you know, demonstrative behaviour with my lover. I never hid the fact we were always openly affectionate in public. I never ever received any form of uh, bigotry or um, attack about that. In fact, I felt people were really loving and really accepting, um, including my own family. One of the unfortunate instances that's happened in, in recent uh, months is the example of the case in Tasmania, which you're probably aware of, uh, where the Roman Catholic Archbishop of Hobart circulated a book to Catholic schools in his diocese explaining the Catholic view of marriage which the church has held for thousands of years and has now been brought before an anti-discrimination tribunal under a particular provision of Tasmanian law which is loosely described as a hate speech provision. Uh, the provision of Tasmanian law that in fact has been used doesn't penalise hate speech, it penalises causing people to be offended and it seems to me that that provision is far too, sets far too low a bar for, for speech. Seeing what had happened to Bishop Porteous made us realise there was a real danger of future litigation over religious and free expression. And even when Australian law was on the side of your position, you could still be taken through the courts by someone who takes offence to it. Now a large organisation like the Catholic Church has the financial resources to fight back, but how long could a local school or business or church down the road last in a battle like this? 
We wanted to ask somebody in the field about the potential cost for standing up for what you believe in. Before entering politics, Nella Hall managed a successful law firm in Sydney. So yes, they can certainly make a complaint to the Human Rights Commission. The Commission, there's, then there is an investigation by the Commissioner and then there is conciliation between the parties. If that is not resolved, if they cannot resolve it, then there is a, another review. That's, if it doesn't get resolved there, then it goes to a full hearing. But to have yourself represented by legal counsel and something like that, it would be costly, yes? You're probably looking just for the barrister, I would say about 10000 for the day. And then, of course, you're looking at the solicitor costs. So the costs are, financial costs are in the tens of thousands of dollars. What about for the, for the party that's brought the complaint that's gone to the Human Rights Commission? Are their costs the same? No, their costs won't be anywhere near the same. It seems that if you have a traditional aspect of marriage and a traditional aspect of life in general, that you're playing into some sort of bigoted, hateful narrative. Uh, what do you think's brought that about? To me, it looks like a political agenda. I don't see a lot of you know, proof uh, of this bigoted, homophobic uh, attitude. I think our society is very accepting and very progressive and I've experienced that and all the people in my community when I was in the lesbian women's community experienced that. None of my community ever expressed a sense that we were attacked or by bigots or homophobes because of our sexuality choice so I don't see that now that we're in 2016 that that's increased. In fact, I think tolerance is much more accepted. I'm not sure, to me, it just looks like a political agenda to bring about a law. Now, some people would say it's fear-mongering to talk about the possibility of future litigation. But consider what happened at the Occidental Hotel in May 2016. A group of LGBT activists contacted the venue and threatened a violent protest if they didn't cancel an event featuring a talk on how conservatives can respond to the challenges of mainstream values. It got so bad that even the police contacted the venue and said they were concerned about the safety of the participants and the possibility of an ugly violent protest. Well, the venue gave in and cancelled not only that booking but all future bookings with the organisers, claiming somehow they'd become a hate group. But not satisfied with that, the Rainbow Jihad Peace Loving Tolerance Movement still protested anyway. So if they're happy to protest an empty venue, we say that our fellow citizens, our friends and family who are same-sex attracted, are our equals in every way. That 1% of couples in Australia who are same-sex attracted already have 100% the same legal status and benefits as any couple, de facto or married. We say they are free to live as they choose, but they are not free to choose a motherless or fatherless existence for future children. Well, what if we we look at the aspect of family now, so uh, children are coming into to the equation. What, what was it like in the 80s with regards to children and same-sex relationships? Well, that was one of the main reasons that I became really disillusioned. I saw women who had children within the lesbian community and I, I have a very uh, passionate heart to want to protect children. My father came from an abusive background and so did my mother. So I feel very passionate about protecting children. So I saw a lot of dysfunction in the way that children were raised within the lesbian community, the, the lack of boundaries, the lack of values, the lack of uh, commitment, the lack of a male role model. Um, there was a lot of our free living also incorporated free drug taking, casual sex, uh, a lot of not working, you know, not facing, not having responsibility. So all these uh, ways that as adults we can make those choices and suffer the consequences of those, that's fine. We're adults, we have that right to choose. But to um, enforce that kind of environment on the upbringing of a child, I believe is really detrimental and not fair on that child. Heather Barwick is one of the adults we've heard recently who was raised by loving lesbian parents, but she wrote last year, a lot of us are hurting. My father's absence created a huge hole in me and I ached every day for a dad. When you throw off the restraints of society, you throw off lots of other things as well. And so children are not offered, I believe, a, 
the healthier environment that they can, they can possibly have when there's the balance of a man and a woman loving each other who are biologically their parents. We do have an institution called adoption um, and adoption is a is a, a, um, a remedy for problems in certain areas which we you know incorporated into the marriage system but over a number of years the children who were adopted grew up to resent the fact that they didn't know the identity of their natural parents and so we had to make lots of changes to require revelation of the birth identity of birth parents and all those sorts of things. Yeah. We are now dealing with a situation where we're going, if we institute same-sex marriage, to set up an institution where we'll assume children will not be raised by their biological parents. And there is now then going to be pressure, in fact there already is pressure, to alter their birth certificate so that they cannot find their biological parents. If, uh, in certain circumstances, if you're dealing with sperm donors, they may have been promised that their identity would never be revealed. And yet, we are cutting children off from that connection. And there are already children now growing up who are children of artificial conception who are talking about the pain that they have when they cannot find a connection with their own parents. Now why would we do that to kids? Do we never learn? Didn't we just apologise for the policy of forced adoption? Where Prime Minister Gillard said we broke the most sacred bond there is, the bond between a mother and her baby. This is just another way to break the bond between mother and baby, father and baby. Now some people will say well this is all too far-fetched, it's not about, it's not what same-sex marriage is about, but the fact is this is what marriage is about. Marriage is about the raising of children yes. uh, as a fundamental part of the institution. We hear a lot about marriage equality, but what about equality for kids? Children have an equal right, wherever possible, to both a mum and a dad. So-called marriage equality forces a child to miss out on a mother or a father. That's not equality for the kids who miss out. That's not marriage. We ask the hard questions of the gay marriage lobby, such as, is it equality if you force some kids to miss out on their dad? And we give examples like Melbourne woman Millie Fontana, who was raised by a loving lesbian couple. There's all this talk about equality for women, for gay people, for, for everybody. But where's the equality for children? We also ask, is it right to force homosexual education on all of our children, where parents have no right to object? After Massachusetts legalized gay marriage, our son came home and told us the school taught him that boys can marry other boys. He's in second grade. We tried to stop public schools from teaching children about gay marriage, but the court said we had no right to object or pull him out of class. And we say, is it honest to lie about what you intend to do with marriage? Fighting for gay marriage generally involves lying about what we're going to do with marriage when we get there. You know, because we lie that the institution of marriage is not going to change. And that is a lie. The institution of marriage is going to change and it should change. Um, and again, I, I don't think it should exist. Again, I think it's adults have the right to choose what they want to do. But children are left out of this equation. Those children are being their right to know their biological parents and to be braised by their biological parents has been taken from them forcefully. And so I don't think it's a very fair um, option for the children. So a plebiscite is held and there's going to be a decision made by the majority of the vote. Somebody's going to be extremely disappointed, whichever way it falls. If it falls in the way that traditional marriage should be upheld, do you think that will end the campaign to change the definition of marriage? I don't think it will, but maybe it might give us a chance to have an open debate about it. Because at the moment the debate is stifled, it seems closed, and it's the rhetoric is, oh, every Australian wants it, Australia wants it, why should we have it? But that's what a plebiscite is supposed to find out, where Australia really sits on the issue. Then in order to have the plebiscite that is fair and equitable for all parties, we need to have that strong, deep debate.
the, the, the problem with the conscience vote is that it just opens up the MPs to the really savage intimidation tactics of the same-sex lobby. And that is something that I think turns off a lot of people who might otherwise be, you know, a bit more open-minded. They just see this very uh, almost totalitarian shutting down of the debate, really vicious character assassination of anyone who tries to stand up for traditional marriage. Well, um, it doesn't, the two wrongs don't make a right, but, but there is the same wrong applies on the other side, Miranda. Um, the Australian Christian Lobby and, and groups associated with it are absolutely ferocious in their opposition to same-sex marriage and work as well. Their lobbying of uh, MPs, including myself, um, is, uh, is quite formidable. And uh, so, But I don't know of anyone losing their job like that guy who was the CEO of Mozilla did in America when he all he'd done was donate a thousand dollars to a you know a traditional marriage group that was against same sex marriage and he was hounded out of his job and yeah, I don't I don't approve of that. No. And I mean, SBS wouldn't run you know a, a very gentle ad about traditional marriage during the gay Mardi Gras. Yeah, it, and I objected to that. In fact, I had an SBS executive come to see me the very next day and I. He left with a flea in his ear. Um, <laughs> it's free speech is one of my fundamental tenets. But the gay lobby acts with raging intolerance against anybody who stands in their way. We experienced that with our first ad when we placed it in the path of the Mardi Gras parade, saying, "Stop! It's not just about you adults. Think of the child." Channels 7 and 9 ran the ad, but SBS refused to show it during their two-hour telecast of the parade. And so it became a big issue of free speech, of the right of our side of this great debate uh, to be heard, not to be censored or demonised. This ad became the most viewed Australian video on YouTube that week with half a million views in five days. And many people who disagreed with our position on marriage defended our right to be heard. Senator Lionhelm, who was moving a gay marriage bill in the Senate. Tim Wilson, the openly gay human rights commissioner. Even the head of Get Up said the ad should never have been pulled by SBS. And Queensland Senator Matt Canavan got the openly gay managing director of SBS, Michael Abid, to admit that yes, he would have run an ad from the gay lobby during Mardi Gras, but not ours. Would you run a pro-gay marriage ad during Mardi Gras? Uh, Helen? I think we would. I think we would. Yes. So you'd allow one side it's of the baby air, but not the other. When you're intent on achieving something big, it can feel like climbing a mountain. But the single-minded focus it takes can leave the rest of us with only that point of view. So it's time to step back and consider all the issues around same-sex marriage. Like how it will affect sex education in schools or how it will affect children. We could even lose certain rights since changing the meaning of marriage has unintended consequences. Same-sex marriage is not as simple as you think. To find out how it might affect you, go to marriagealliance.com.au. The Australian Christian Lobby, in my view, have sensibly said there's this issue of free speech. Now, that's been painted in the media as the Australian Christian Lobby want to wind back discrimination laws, right. the Australian Christian Lobby want to authorise hate speech. That has not been what they've said. They don't want to authorise speech that incites hatred. But what they want to do is to be sure that legislation that's framed in that way cannot be plausibly even used to try and shut down some good faith, respectful debate on, on the issues. Exactly. It, to me, it's like putting out a little spark a little match with a, with a swimming pool. It's going to change our democratic right to have an opinion and ability to parent our children the way we choose. It's about shutting up my voice. They're taking away the freedom 
of a vast, great other gr group of people, people like me who have been in that life um, and come out of it and disagree with it and want to help other people to, to know that they have an option as well. They don't have to be in that life. In Australia, we value our freedoms and we all support everybody's right to disagree with us. That's how we conduct debates, that's how we conduct conversations. And that the content of this documentary that you've been looking at may be views that you don't agree with. And I support completely your right to disagree with those. And I hope that you support my right to disagree with you on anything. That's what freedom's based on. And we will remove that right and we take that away from people and we replace it with the law that says you can no longer think this way especially in the situation where it is a way that you've thought for as a collective thought for hundreds of years and as a collective world history thought for thousands of years. There's an example perhaps that we can bring up which is a, a lady in uh, Washington state in the United States called Baron L. Stutzman who's a florist and she had a customer uh, who uh, was a long-term customer of his and she regularly sold flowers to this person and she was aware that he was gay. He came though to her one day and said I'm going to get married and in another state, I think, because at the time they didn't recognise marriage in that state for same-sex couples. And uh, he said, I'd like you to provide the flowers. And she said, look, I, I, I'm sorry, I'm a Christian person. I believe marriage is between a man and a woman. And uh, even though I care for you, I can't cater for your wedding in this way. And she was then prosecuted under the uh, local law and she was fined. We all know how in Tasmania, a transgender Greens candidate took offence last year at the pastoral letter on marriage by Australia's Catholic bishops and took a, a Hobart's Archbishop Julian Portis to the Anti-Discrimination Commission. And Angela, Shallahan, Angela Shanahan, the columnist with The Australian, wrote at the time, quote, Since when has teaching your children what you and most of the world's population believe to be right been a thought crime? End quote. All of this is happening while we have no law for same-sex marriage. What level of intimidation might the church expect once homosexual marriage is the law of the land? Tomorrow morning I'll be presenting a petition to the Senate which calls on the government and the education minister to remove all federal funding from the Safe Schools Coalition program because it goes beyond education and it compels students into advocacy of a social engineering agenda. We've started to hear about a program called the Safe Schools Program. Now, ACL's been talking about it. I've seen some interviews with you and others regarding the impact of the program and the content of the program. And some would say just that it's a bit unbelievable what's yeah. actually in it. Do you want to, Can you give us some more insight into what you've seen? It, it is unbelievable. I mean, it took us more than 12 months to get this into the public arena because people just didn't believe that this could actually be true. The second part of this package deal is radical LGBT sex education for your child. After New York State passed its uh, gay marriage law in 2011, Daniel Villarreal wrote this, quote, I and a lo lot of other people want to indoctrinate, recruit, and expose children to queer sexuality. And there's nothing wrong with that, says Daniel. Now here in Australia, the sexual radicals running the Safe Schools program agree. The principal author, Ros Ward, sees indoctrination with queer sexuality as a continuation of the Marxist quest to destroy traditional structure and values. Safe Schools, as you know, is a government-funded program that has been smuggled in under the pretext of reducing bullying, but is in fact a means of sexually messing with your children's minds without you knowing about it, but while you pay for it. They ask children to imagine that they have no genitals when they're talking about their gender. Liberal National Party MP George Christensen made claims that there were links on the Safe Schools resource affiliated website, minus18.org.au, to adult sex shops. So let's use this great tool on the internet called the Wayback Machine, found at archive.org. And there's the link. So let's visit the link and see what's there. On the surface, no mention of breast binders, but it does look like George was right. So what will come next? And for anybody who has the time to keep a close eye on all of this, you will be slandered and called homophobic for your trouble. It is pushing them to conform to a certain world view, and it asks children as young as 11 to imagine themselves in a sexualized or hypersexualized <laughs> environment. 
This is the program that teaches year seven students to imagine you are 16 and going out with a person of the same sex that you are really into, that instructs troubled children in the arts of breast binding and penis tucking to disguise their unwanted gendered characteristics. The first thing that I saw of it was a boy dressed in a school, girl's school uniform with the, the slogan, gender is not uniform. So telling kids that um, just because you know, biologically you're a male or a female, uh, your gender is not necessarily related to your biology. And this is very, very confusing. Some will argue none of this really matters because the safe schools materials are voluntary. But by 2019, government schools in Victoria will be forced to join this program. And the pressure on other schools is increasing. The, the way they're presenting the, same, the Safe School program is you're given two options. One is you completely accept what they're saying is true and right, or your class is having a mental illness. You're called phobic, which is an extreme fear of something. So being, you're talking homophobic. Yeah, so being homophobic means you have an extreme fear. Well, what about the middle option, which is that you just don't agree? I don't agree that homosexuality is a viable, healthy lifestyle choice. I don't want my children to be taught that, I don't want my future grandchildren to be taught that, and I believe they have the right. Again, we're taking the rights of the children away and imposing adult opinions on children. In less than a week, 9,499 concerned Australians signed the petition, demonstrating that there are many that are worried about this propaganda in our schools. It's important to note that since groups like the ACL and some LNP backbenchers raised the alarm about the program's content, a full review was ordered by the Turnbull government back in March 2016, resulting in a lot of the content being toned down or removed. However, the Daniels Labor government in Victoria has sworn to keep the original content and its full resources despite the federal government's directives. So with this being the case, and the fact that the Labor and Greens parties campaigned against the review, we can assume that in the right political climate, it will all come back fully as it once was. So you might think, what has all this got to do with same-sex marriage? In 2004, when same-sex marriage was legalised in Massachusetts, a Christian citizen by the name of David Parker was made aware of a book that came home with his son from kindergarten. It was about a diverse set of family values. It featured uh, interracial families and it also featured same-sex couples as families. And while understanding that represented some people's values, it didn't represent the Parkers and they decided to exercise their religious freedom and opt out. They sent several communications to the school requesting that when the school did this type of instruction they be made aware of it so they can remove their children from the classroom during those times. After many unsuccessful attempts, David addressed the Lexington School Committee with concerns about homosexuality being presented to his son and the school not accommodating his parental rights in the matter. The school committee refused to respond. The following day at Eastbrook Public School, at a meeting arranged by the school for David Parker to attend and address his concerns, David Parker was arrested for trespassing. Following his arrest and subsequent night in jail, the parents of the Lexington community rallied to the Parker's side in their defence. A civil lawsuit was filed by the Parkers and another family fighting for the right to exercise their religious freedoms and liberties in opting their children out of classrooms where they were teaching subject matter that was contrary to their Christian beliefs. The lawsuit gathered huge media attention. Now all of the country looked on as this became a test case for the rights of the parents to opt out and or remove their children from any teaching programs that contravene their personal or religious beliefs inside the school curriculum. Now with same-sex marriage being law in the state of Massachusetts, the legal terms of reference were somewhat different. In a summary of the judge's ruling, federal judge Mark Wolf seemed to agree with the defense that now that same-sex marriage is law in the state of Massachusetts, Schools have a mandate to teach what they call diversity, which includes normalising same-sex romantic relationships in the minds of elementary school children. Furthermore, in broad terms, he said that it was not appropriate to remove children from the classroom during such teachings, as it may upset some of the other students. Now, parents in Australia who agree with something like the Safe Schools program may think the ruling in this case was correct. But if same-sex marriage becomes the law of the land in Australia, the legal framework and the terms of reference will change with it. And for the majority of parents who disagree with the extreme edge of these teachings and other programs like it, your rights to withdraw and disagree may be overridden by the courts. We have an option now to just sit by 
and allow um, things to take their course. What's the cost of silence? What would you like to say to anyone who's just watching the events unfold? Please speak up because the media is having us believe that the whole of Australia is supportive of this and we're not. And when they understand that there is a truth to marriage which is not made up by politicians, it's not made up by society. Uh, we'll look back in 10 years time and we'll be asking ourselves the question, what, what more could I have done? Uh, I think our kids will be asking us, what did you do? Our forefathers went to war and fought for us to be able to be a democratic nation where people can have an opinion. And we're about to lose that. It's not about people being free to love one another. This same-sex marriage is not about people loving one another. It's about taking freedom away from people um, and it's about empowering others and forcing us to accept something that we don't agree with. Once they get some fire in their belly about the injustice of changing marriage, the injustice to future children of deliberately depriving them of a mother or a father, not, not by tragic accident, by an act of parliament. Once they see how wrong that is. Things as simple as letterbox dropping, volunteering, uh, being available on, on the polling day to hand out um, uh, how to vote cards that encourage people to vote uh, in favour of marriage between a man and a woman. And once they see how radical the agenda is that will come with same-sex marriage, the radical sex education, the radical destruction of the notion of parenting, of kinship bonds, of um, group marriage having to follow from, from same-sex marriage as a point of logic. Once they understand this, I say stop. The other side will be out in force. They will have lots of campaign workers. There'll be lots of rainbow flags. Uh, we shouldn't be intimidated by any of that. We, we are nice people. We want our gay friends to, to live in peace. But they cannot choose a motherless or fatherless existence for future children. They cannot choose to impose radical sex education on all of our children. They cannot choose to destroy the very meaning of parenting of male and female. But uh, we need to also make sure we show up because decisions in politics are made by those who show up. We need a big army of people. While we have the power to have a voice, we need to use that voice because soon it's going to be taken away from us. Don't sleep, wake up and make your voice be known while we can.